Let's continue. At the beginning of chapter 14, Bivaldo reads Grisostomo's desperate song. It is another of Cervantes' masterpieces. Its review of the spectrum of feelings associated with unrequited love anticipates romanticism by two centuries. Its epic and infernal rendering of the emotional battle that ends with the death of the young hero reincarnates the two previous centuries of Petrarchism. Note in particular how Cervantes allows the lover to link up his wretched entrails and bitter heart with the topography of the Mediterranean. Both main rivers of the Spanish peninsula, the Father Tajo and famous Betis, as well as the desert wastelands of Libya, are all made witness to the great wrong, mal, suffered by the poet. And what wrong is this? Grisostomo specifies Marcella's denial as the cause of his jealousy, which leads to his suicide. Jealousy kills with utmost rigor, and oh, in the kingdom of love, jealousy is a fierce tyrant. Grisostomo commits suicide unrepentant in his fantasy, blaming both Marcella and the ancient tyranny of love itself. All this leads to a series of grim mythological allusions to Tantalus, Syphilis, Ixion, and the 50 daughters of Danaus. The first two raise the experience of love to the level of transcendental suffering, the root cause of being damned to eternal hell. More importantly, perhaps, Ixion was the first murderer according to Greek mythology, and the Danaids were all killed by their husbands on their wedding night. These make the problem of human desire inseparable from human violence. Now, whenever we grasp a character's point of view in Don Quixote, we are almost certain to find another character expressing its opposite. The experience of Cervantes' irony involves this continuous play of perspectives. When he finishes Grisostomo's poem, Bivaldo, said he did not think it accorded with all he had heard about the modesty and kindness of Marcella because Grisostomo complained of jealousy, suspicion, and neglect, all to the depreciation of the good credit and name of Marcela. In other words, the whole poem slanders the murderous shepherdess, and this observation signals the final phase of Grisostomo's story, which now gives way to the sudden appearance of Marcela. A marvelous vision, she is so beautiful that she exceeded the fame of her beauty. Marcela is one of the characters most discussed by critics of Cervantes' novel, and she has made for heated debate about his intentions. It's easy to see why. Marcela has arrived to respond to Grisostomo's allegations, and she is both logical and forceful in her rejection of the popular judgment against her. Marcella articulates her case with the accuracy of a lawyer and the profundity of a philosopher. She uses examples and makes observations about her particular case. Let's listen to some of her arguments, which repeatedly undermine the Petrarchan logic of Grisostomo and his friends. First, she discards the notion that she ought to reciprocate the love of others simply because she is beautiful. I do not see why, just because it is loved, a thing loved for its beauty is obliged to love the one who loves it. Moreover, it might happen that the lover of that which is beautiful is himself ugly, and since ugliness is worthy of abhorrence, it is absurd for anyone to say, I love you for your beauty, you must love me even though I am ugly. She then indicates the social chaos that would result if Grisostomo's value system were applied in reality. If all beauties were to fall in love and surrender, there would be a chaos of confused and misguided wills unable to know where to stop. This is an ominous anticipation of the central episodes of the novel. Marcella then points out the hypocrisy of men who, on the one hand, place hyperbolic values on the chastity of women, and then insist that women surrender to their desires. If honesty is one of the virtues that most adorn and beautify the body and the soul, then why should she who is loved for her beauty relinquish that virtue just in order to satisfy the desire of a man who, according to his own fancy, attempts with all his might and industry to have her lose it? More than anything else, Marcella lays claim to her freedom, saying that love must be voluntary, not forced, and asking, why do you want me to surrender my will by force? And finally, she affirms, 
I was born free. Further, she insists her personal conduct never validated any of Grisostomo's fantasies. Let not any man call me cruel or murderous if I never promise, deceive, call, or accept him. She concludes by begging everyone to take note. Let this general disillusionment serve as a warning to those who solicit me for their own benefit. And let it be understood henceforth that if any man dies for me, he does not die of jealousy or misfortune, because she who loves no one cannot make anyone jealous. Then she turned her back and disappeared into the thickest part of the nearby woods. Marcella has announced many of the major problems of the rest of the work. What is love if not the root cause of social chaos? What place does a woman's choice have in romantic relationships? We will have many chances to remember Marcella, whose martial name links her to the goddess Diana, fleeing the eager eyes of so many men pursuing her through the woods. For now, notice Don Quixote's hilarious reaction. First, he leaps to defend Marcella's right to be left alone. Let no person, no matter his state or condition, dare follow the beautiful Marcella, lest he fall victim to my furious indignation. Sounds fair enough, right? But what are we to make of the paradox that after saying goodbye to Vivaldo and the others who are headed for Seville, because it was a place perfectly suited to finding adventures, our knight then decides to seek out the shepherdess Marcella and offer to serve her in any capacity. Love can be imperious, tyrannical even, and perhaps most especially so when it is subconscious. 